I owe a hundred, but if the bank forecloses on me in the long run, they're only going to collect 80 because of the market, because of the house is in bad repair, because they have to hire an attorney, all of that. Why wouldn't I just find a buyer like Christina who says, I'll pay you $80,000 today, same amount of money, but let's move on. And the bank says, you know what? We'll take 80,000 instead of 100 and call it even. That's a short sale. So in that case, would the um, the person who was like foreclosed on, would they still owe that extra 20,000? Typically not, because the bank is accepting this as okay. payment in full. Now, I'm not telling you that they cannot not try to do that. They can. They have the right to. But typically, they're accepting it as payment in full. Think of it this way. If someone owes you $5 and you're going to have to drive across town and beat him up and do all of that to get the money back, or he offers you $3 today to call it even, you know what? It's not worth the effort. Give me the $3 and we'll call it even. That's a short sale. All right? Unless you can hire someone else to beat him up for you. No, I'm just kidding. The sale is a regular mechanism. Still go to title companies, still have a deed, they, they still sign, all of that. So the mechanism of a short sale is the normal sale. The only difference is the bank is accepting less money than is owed. They are accepting short of the payoff. So, like, it is like this just as bad as the deed in lieu of foreclosure, or like, is it like similar no, to that? This is not because this is prior. Good question, though. In in the process, you want to sell their house. The second process, you would try is a short sale, then foreclosure, because in a short sale, it shows up as a credit as a sold and closed account but it doesn't show up short i it just now you may have some late payments like we talked about earlier because that's how you got into this position but it's not a foreclosure it actually shows up as a closed transaction because they accepted 80 as payment in full so this short sale actually happens before the foreclosure because once the foreclosure happens, that it's the house is gone. Cameron, you got a question? I was gonna say, so like a short sale is basically just like risk management on the bank's part. So yeah, that's right. exactly what it is. It's a risk management tool. If they're gonna get the same number today as they're going to get after they spend all this time effort, exactly the, the point, all right? Now, there's a couple co consumer protection laws with the Dodd-Frank Act that came in in 2010. They have now decided to protect the consumer a whole bunch more. There's a whole bunch of new laws. We are actually going to spend a whole chapter on them, so we are going to cover them later. But remember, these new consumer protection laws are designed to curtail abusive lending practices. These new laws are designed to protect the consumer from the mortgage industry taking advantage of the client. So that is that section. Now, also dealing with the mortgage, we're gonna talk a little bit about homeowner's insurance over on page 226. There are two types of homeowner's insurance. There's a basic policy and a broad form policy. And I have told you before that this book is not a memorization book, except for here. 
And I certainly don't want to ruin your fun to tell you which one of these to memorize. All right. You guys know how to memorize two lists? Memorize one. And if it's not one of the things you remember, it's on the other list. All right. So I definitely have heard rumors that there is a question about which one of these is on the which policy. And I know, but I don't want to ruin your fun. Okay. Now, when it comes to insurance, there are actually two types of policies or two types of insurance. There is one that is called replacement. And there's one that's called the cash policy. The replacement policy does not take into consideration the depreciation of an item. All right. Let me show you what I mean. If you have a $500 TV that gets stolen and you have the cash policy, they will say, oh, well, it's depreciated $300. So here's your cash $200. All right. If you have the replacement, let's mark this number two, that's number one. So we can say here's the number two one. And the number one, you've got $500 TV. It gets burnt or lost or stolen or hurt in an earthquake. They pay you the $500 to replace it. All right. So, first question is if there is an insurance policy, that will pay to replace everything, why would anybody have a cash policy and use it? Why would you have the cash policy if there's one that will repay me what the thing is worth? The answer is the cost of the policy. We call it a premium, right? Your monthly premium is higher on a replacement policy than it would be here. Let's make up some numbers. Suppose this policy is $50 a month. This one may be only $25 a month. So you're actually taking the risk. And uh, Cameron, here's your risk management again. This is actually what an actuar actuarialist does. You take the, the probability of if this disaster, whatever this was, earthquake, stolen, fire, happens, and then you determine, well, I saved $25 a month, and if I need that difference, I will go over here to this bank account that I've been saving these difference and pay that $300. That is called coinsurance on the difference so the cash policy the monthly premium is always less than the replacement policy because the cash figures in the depreciation of an item and pays you what the value is today not what it costs to replace it all right the difference in those costs are what you guys should be saving every month. I'm sure you guys all have your insurance replacement bank account reserves in place, right? <coughs> I don't see any hands going up. <laughs> the theory is the difference in the monthly premiums you put in the bank account you save so that when you need that $300, you've got it saved over there in that account. And then you could do the math and figure how many months do I need to save for that probability to happen. And that's how they figure life insurance. You know, they look at someone like Cameron or Ross or Jaman and go, look, they're young, healthy guys. What are the odds they're going to die compared to Raymond, who's a cigar guy, bourbon guy, old and fat? Odds are I'm going out before they are. So my policy costs more because there's a bigger chance that I'm going out before they go out, all right? 
same concept. That's how insurance works. Now, there is this database called Clue. Clue, the Comprehensive Loss Underwriting Exchange. This is a database that all insurance companies use to make sure that a consumer does not try and pull a fast one on the insurance company. What I'm telling you is this. Suppose you have a hail damage and you call your insurance agent Flo, right, from Progressive and you make a claim and they pay you. The next day you forget and you call the general, get an insurance policy, and then make a claim on the roof again, he can go to this clue database and all insurance companies use this and they go, Raymond? According to the database, our buddy Flo over there, Progressive, paid you out last month. Oh, what's going on? Uh oh, caught. All right. So that's what this database does. It records all the payouts of all insurance companies so that they each can check to make sure that someone didn't make a claim on this property a year ago, two years ago, yesterday for the same issue. We use it so that when the buyer comes in and wants to make an insurance claim on the roof, they don't come back and go, hey, the seller did that two weeks ago. Did he not replace the roof for you? We actually had this happen a couple of years ago on a purchase. Eli had the buyer and the, when they called to get their homeowner's insurance, the homeowner's insurance, I guess, ran the house in clue and came back and called our buyer and said, hey, make sure you check to see if it's got a brand new roof on it. So in the inspection, we found the old roof with three layers and we called the other agent and we're like, dude, you need to talk to your seller because he got paid for a new roof about 14 months ago and we just found he didn't repair the roof. That's insurance fraud. So the seller, guess what the seller did real quick? put a brand new roof on the house before we bought it because he got paid for it, but he used the money who knows where, all right? So we can, in effect of, in essence, use this database on the transfer of property so that we know, hey, he's made a claim on that roof or they haven't made a claim, either way. Now, flood insurance is a separate insurance that is required if your property is deemed to be in the floodplain. The floodplains are already drawn and they've been around. Greenwood just went through a redrawing of their floodplain. I don't know. And it took some people out and it put some people in. Here's the stinky part about it. If your property, any part of it is in the floodplain, your entire property requires the insurance. We're doing right now a deal where our buyer finally said, you know what, I'll just pay the insurance. The corner of his lot is in the floodplain, so his insurance company is actually requiring a flood insurance policy, which is, I don't know, it was $1,100 or $1,200 a year, something like that. Now, you can get out of the floodplain if you think you're not in it. You can hire a surveyor and they will go and do a survey of your property. And if they see that you're out by like 12 inches, they can actually write a certificate that you can submit to the government and say, my house really is not in the floodplain. And you can get an exemption certificate to not have to buy that. All right. Because there's only one underwriter in the entire United States, FEMA. The Federal Emergency Management Agency is the only underwriter to the property. Federal Emergency Management Agency. 
I have a question. Now, once you get that document saying that you're exempt from on that particular property, if I sold that property, do the next buyer or uh, have to get that same document and does it stick to that property? The document itself would stick to the property. Okay. All right. So you would say, as the buyer, I would come in and go, look, dude, there's a flood insurance. I, I Maybe I don't want this house. And you're going to go, no, 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 wait. I've got an exemption from FEMA. Here's the document. This property is not in the flood insurance. Oh, give me the document. Let me show my insurance company so that they don't charge me a flood policy. And we're back on business to buy your house. So the document, it's one time. It's attached to the house. And I believe you can actually go to their website and check yourself to see if my house is in the floodplain. If it's got an exemption, it's been listed. So I can go and look on any house, pull up the address. Well, there's no exemption on file, so it must be in the floodplain. Or, oh, yeah, I see an exemption was granted to that house. So that document's out there, and it's good transferable, all right? Now, flood insurance is designed to protect you against the overflow or the sudden rapid uh, overflow of water, like from an inland or a tidal wave, an unusual or rapid accumulation of surface waters, mud flows or mud slides, and the collapse of land along the shore of a, like a dam, right? And if you remember back when we talked about water rights, we, at that time we talked about floodplain is that body of water, body of land adjacent to like a river, and the flood water would be when that river overflows into that floodplain. That's typically what's defined as the floodplain is some area that skirts you got the river and then the floodplain might be alongside of it or a lake may have a floodplain, all right? And that would require you to have a flood insurance. Any questions on that? All right, that is the end of chapter 12. I'm actually going to call it there today. I think an hour and two hours is close enough. Um, this will affect our test. We're going to push it back, but we're way jacked up anyway. All right. And I, once again, I certainly don't want to cram information down your throat via this method rather than online because that this is a little tougher for us to communicate. All right. So, Today's Friday. Monday, we'll do 13. Tuesday, we're going to go back and pick up 11. And then Wednesday, we'll have a test. Thumbs up. All right. At this point, we're going to go ahead and end the recording.